Tonight I am here with Dr. Sean T. Smith. He's a clinical psychologist and an author of five books. Sean, how are you doing tonight? Good. Thanks for having me on, Tony. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Uh, give everybody a background story on yourself. A background story? Well, I guess how, how did I become a psychologist? Is that... Yeah, I think that, that's... Yeah. We'll start well, there. Okay. Well, I got interested in psychology when I was a kid, and I probably told the story a million times. But my, my father owned a bar in this industrial area north of Denver called Commerce City when I was a kid. So from about 9 to 16, pretty formative years, that's where I spent my nights and weekends. And I got to see a lot of adult things going on a, a, around me that I didn't quite understand and saw a lot of romance. I saw a lot of things falling apart. I saw a conflict. I saw people smooching in the corner. I mean, I, I got to really see things that most kids don't get to see. And it got me interested in, in how relationships work and how people work. And so, you know, all these years later, here I am. Okay, cool. Now, your books, what was the first book that you wrote? The first book I wrote was called Surviving Aggressive People. And this was right, I finished this up right before I went back to graduate school because I went to graduate school kind of late because it took me a while to round up the money and so forth to get there. But that was a book about de-escalation. And that was also one of the, the passions that I picked up from my father's bar because my father was very skilled at calming people down. And you wouldn't know what to look at him because he's kind of a big, brash, huge personality, big alpha type, but he was very psychologically adept and he could he could really um, diffuse situations very carefully. And he got me interested in how to do that because when I was a kid, I got I was bullied a little bit like a lot of kids are. And I watched my father handling things and I thought, well, I want to get good at that because I'm not very good at it right now. So I need to learn some skills. And so I, I learned from him and then I, I went on and had some other experiences. I put myself in environments where I could learn from people and practice de-escalation. And that eventually turned into that book, Surviving Aggressive People. Okay, good. Now in the bar world, wouldn't they call a guy like that a cooler? I think they would call him a cooler. Because he I never cools heard that term, down the yeah. situation. Yeah. I've yeah. not heard that term. I think in the bar world, yeah, they call sense. it. Yeah. Now, yeah. let me ask you a question. Would this, I'm just curious, but would Tactical Guide to Women, would that be your most popular book? Yeah, hands down. And it's my baby. It's hands it's down. the one that I had the most passion about writing. And um, yeah, it's it's definitely the most popular one. Okay. And now there's also a book for women and that is called the practical guide to men mm -hmm. why yeah, the, why the two different titles because I mean, and i put a lot of thought into the titles and the reason i chose the practical guide to men for women is i chose the word practical because um to get in a little bit into my practice i work a lot with couples and um it's fascinating work working with couples and so you do this for a decade you know, a, a decade or two, I'm, I'm about 16 years into that probably. And you notice patterns and you notice relationships that work out poorly and relationships that work out well. And so I started cataloging early on, what are the kinds of mistakes that men and women make that put them into God awful relationships? And what are the, the good strategies that, you know, that the useful strategies that they use to get into good relationships? And so one of the things that I noticed, and it's just more my opinion than anything I could quantify clinically is that women tend to make mistakes of the heart. They tend to make mistakes where they, they follow their heart into uh, situations where they think they can, they can help, they can repair and, and that sort of thing. And so they tend to be mistakes that, that are sort of, pra or, or the antidote to those mistakes would be more of a practical solution. Like, okay, let's set your heart aside for a little bit and let's talk about practicalities. And it's a book that I want my daughter to read someday so about how to approach men and, and relationships. The mistakes that I saw mist men making were more along uh, tactical lines. Like they weren't thinking ahead into, they weren't looking at the, the relationship dynamic and thinking, what is this going to look like in 20 years? And so they tended to be more tactical mistakes. And so the, the, the antidote to those sorts of mistakes that are just sort of recklessness and also mistakes of the heart, you know, each side makes both kinds of mistakes, but the antidote to that would be more 
tactical advice. Let's think about how this person is going to fit into your life, how this relationship is going to fit into your life, what it's going to look like 10 years down the road, and let's keep you out of family court because that's no place that any guy wants to end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, in your book, I'm going to tell you my favorite chapter, and I remember this chapter very well, but it's avoid the most common blunders. It's chapter eight. Now, to me, that I guess it's chapter eight. To me, that was real interesting. I really liked that chapter resonated with me probably the most. So tell me about the most common blunders that men make. And oh, there was one there was one there was one part in here about cohabitating. Mm -hmm. And it had said, um, where is it here? Yeah, be clear about your non-negotiable terms, which to me was something that I think a lot of men aren't clear on that, and they really don't have non-negotiable terms. So t yes. talk a little about that. Non-negotiable terms. Now, a lot of guys don't have non-negotiable terms, and this is one of those tactical errors. Guys are not typically trained to think about what the other person brings to the table. They're typically trained to think about what we bring to the table and how we can serve and how we can be of use to the other person. And it's really important to go into these kind of arrangements thinking the other way too. Yeah, it's useful to think about what you bring, but you also need to be thinking about what they bring. And um, the first part of what you said was about, uh, I, I think you touched on a part where I talk about being very clear about what the status of the relationship is. Guys get really sloppy about this. And the status of the relationship is she's a girlfriend or she's a friend. She's a girlfriend. She's a fiance or an intended or some equivalent of that, or she's a wife or a partner or some equivalent of that. So there are some, some discrete categories and don't get sloppy about those. If she's your girlfriend, she doesn't need your She doesn't need her tampons under your sink. Cause that's not mm -hmm. what a girlfriend does. That's what a wife does. And the reason that's important, you know, those kind of boundaries, those little boundaries like that, like you don't get a puppy with somebody that isn't, um, that you don't have a long-term plan that you both have signed on to. You don't get a car lease. You don't share an apartment. You don't do these things because once you develop these entanglements, it's hard to back out. And this comes out of the research of some people who happen to be here in Denver. There's also some researchers in Australia, but there are some researchers here at the University of Denver, like Scott Stanley, Galena Rhodes, and they look at intentionality in relationships and how that affects outcomes down the road. And people who just allow themselves to be drawn into relationships for example, using uh, excuses like, well, it just makes sense to move in together. You'll hear that kind of thing a lot. And in fact, that's one of the studies that came out of Australia, I think, was people, uh, when they were asked, why did you move in together? Their response was something along the lines of, well, it just made sense. It was convenient. When you allow yourself to slide into relationships like that and, and develop these entanglements without intention, number one, it's really hard to back out. And guys in particular have a hard time when the emotional pressure comes to, they have a hard enough time as it is when they also then have to deal with her heartbreak because things aren't working out and they have to deal with a landlord or they have to figure out what to do with the dog or they have to figure out what to do with this car that they've leased together. It becomes easy for that guy to say, well, I guess I'll just tough it out because that's sort of the male mindset. That's what we're taught to do is you tough it out and you fix things. So if you avoid those entanglements, then you avoid putting yourself in that situation where it's harder to escape. The other thing that comes out of this research is that the outcomes aren't real great if you slide into a relationship like that. Intentionality is very important that if you're going to build a life with this person, that you make sure that your values are aligned and you two have similar goals and you have a plan that both of you are going to enact. You're not just going to slide into something because it's convenient and it's easier for her to drive to work from your apartment than it is from hers. So let's just shack up. That's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you, sorry, I'll, I'll stop here after this, but where that kind of sliding can ultimately end up if you're not careful is family court and guys do not want to go to family court. Nobody wants to go to family court aside from a few psychopaths and, you know, personality disorder people, but family court doesn't work out well for men typically as, as much as it does for women. And so you start sliding in that direction. You know, don't be surprised if that's where you end up. Now, when you said convenience, that triggered me because I think that probably most men and women 
who cohabitate don't have an end goal. I mm -hmm. think that's probably one of the issues. And convenience. Convenience would include, you know, splitting the rent or who knows if, you know, men and women always split the rent. Convenience mm -hmm. would be, like you said, closer to work. Convenience would be would also be, I think men would look at it as it's an easier access to sex, which probably doesn't work out like they think. So go ahead and no. expand on that a little, if you would. Well, <laughs> no, yeah, sometimes it works out okay, I guess. But no, if you're moving in and making these sort of entanglements just because it's a convenient source of sex, um, is not a great position uh, in terms of negotiating power to be coming from. And let's be honest, some of this is a business negotiation. We, we need to part of the task here on both sides for men and women is to pull a little bit of the romance out of this and talk about the fact that there are real life consequences to the decisions that you make. And part of it is a bit of a, nego a business negotiation. Mm -hmm. So let's treat it as such. Would yeah. you, are you for or against people cohabitating before they get married? Well, I, I don't care. I'm the most libertarian person in the world, so I don't care what people do. But what the research suggests is that if you're going to live with somebody, cohabitate, it works out. Typically, it works out as, as well as anything else if it's part of a plan. If you know that, yeah, we're, gonna, we're moving in together, but it's not for convenience. It's because we're going to build a life together. Then that's, you know, that tends to work out okay. It's the relationships that, or the, the cohabitating out of convenience. Those are the ones that typically don't work out as well. Okay. When you're, when you have your clients are, do you, is it, do you typically have people that are just in a relationship or married couples, which is, which is more? It's more often married couples. And, and part of that I think is because when you're married, you're more invested in, and when I say married, that doesn't necessarily mean there's a marriage license. It may, okay. it may just mean that people have decided, Hey, we're, we're going to stick it out. So, you know, married or, or partnered mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it. It tends to be that because when you make that sort of commitment to somebody, then you're also committing to solving the problems as best you can that come up. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, I certainly see some, um, boyfriend, girlfriend type relationships or, you know, other, less than not less than married, but different than married, but yeah, mostly the committed relationships. Have you ever told anybody it's over? Like, there's just, you guys need to just go away. I mean, it's just not going to work. No, I would never say that to somebody um, because who am I to say, you know, that it's not going to work. However, I will be very direct with people about the nature of the problem that they're solving and that um, this, you're going to, for this to work, you're going to probably going to have to do X, Y, and Z. Are you up for doing X, Y, and Z? And if the answer is no, then they've just answered the question, but it's not up to me to say you two don't have any business together. Okay. I have my opinions, of course, but part of the job is I keep my opinions to myself. Okay. So the reason I asked you that is because I've asked a few of the dating coaches that I've talked with recent in the recent past here, and some have said definitely. Yeah. But I think what, what I'm getting from you is in a more, I don't want, I don't like using the word professional, but you're, you're more clinical and you've spent a lot of time and a lot of schooling. So I think your answer would be different. Well, and I'm also dealing with people who are trying to solve problems and they've already mm -hmm. built something together. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say to them, boy, you, you two sure screwed up putting this together. What, the, what the hell were you thinking? That's not my mm -hmm. place to say that. Okay. But All right. you know, I do, I work with a lot of guys. I have a coaching arm in my practice and a lot of guys that come to me are trying to sort out if such and such person is a good fit for them. And so we'll delve into their, their background a little bit and this other person's background that the other person I'm not so concerned about whatever person they're worried about, whether or not they fit, that's not really my concern. If you're my client, we're going to talk about you. And so we'll talk about the decisions that you've made in the past, how you came to them, where, what your patterns are, what the patterns you grew up around. And then is there something about this person that might not work well with your patterns? And if so, you're going to change your patterns or may, maybe you move on because when you're trying to make that decision at the beginning of the relationship, that's a, that's a pretty good time to be thinking about this might not be right. When you're 10 years into marriage, that's not the greatest time to be thinking this isn't right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you there. Um, I'm going to ask you a direct question. A friend of mine recently was blindsided 
Now, what happened was, and this is recent, when I say recent, within the past probably three months, and he's expedited his, his divorce rather quickly. He found out his wife was cheating on him, okay? And he's a, he's a, he's a wealthy guy. You know, he's in the medical profession. He's a wealthy guy. And what do you say to a guy like that? I mean, he's reached out to me. We've sad had, you know, had a couple, three, four hour discussions. And, um, but what do you say to a guy like that now that is divorced, just lost a million and a half dollars in a, we'll just say the most beautiful, newest electric car. I'm not going to say the brand, but I mean, this is what he was hit with. He, I mean, he expedited it quick because he didn't, he just didn't want to drag it on, but mm -hmm. he was totally blindsided and was cheated on. What do you say to a guy like that? That's coming out now back into the dating world. Well, that, first of all, that really sucks to get blindsided and have to drop a million and a half. And man, that that's a raw deal. So without knowing any more about this person, I, I would, I would guess that one of the primary tasks is to not, uh, not be, I hate this word traumatized, but, but to not be traumatized by that. And, and so let's operationalize that word. I don't like that word because it's, it's so overused and it, it sounds so squishy. So to not let that experience blind you to the point where you're just going to recreate it again. And, and this is a very common relationship pattern is that people will come out of a marriage and they don't do the work of the, the really crappy work of figuring out how they ended up in that marriage, what they did to end up in that situation. And that's a really rotten question to have to look at after a situation like that, where you got blindsided and you had to, <laughs> and you had to pony up. That's, that's ridiculous. But still as unfair as it is, if you're going to get back out there, you, you've got to do a little bit of soul searching about how it is that you ended up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we had a talk, um, this past, not this past Sunday, but it'd be a week ago Sunday. <clears throat> In fact, he, it was my turn to pick up the tab. And when the tab came, he decided he was going to pick up the tab because he said, I think you saved me another million dollars. Now, he had gone on some dating sites and one of the sites he went on was like it was like a millionaire matchmaker website that one of his friends told him to go on. And I told uh -huh. him to get off that right now. You are no longer a doctor. You are now an, a registered nurse, an RN. As far as anybody's concerned, when uh -huh. you meet someone, you're an RN. That was my advice to him about that situation. What would your advice be to him? Um, I would be really curious about why, why the millionaire dating website, what, what's going on there? Why that particular choice? He's, he's clear. I would imagine he's bringing something else to the table other than his money, but he's saying, all I bring to the table is my money. That's the message to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's exactly what, what I talked to him about. It's like, uh -huh. you can't be on there. You know, I understand that women like status. I mean, these are one of the things, but you know, I, I even said, don't even bring a woman to your house. I mean, his house is beautiful. Don't drive to the day in a Tesla. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I give him the best advice I could from everything that I've collected over the years. But I do see I do see an awful struggle in his, you know, when when you're talking to somebody like that, you can just see their struggle. And I think he wants to get right back in the dating scene. Huh. So do you think that's a good idea? I, I think insight would be really useful for him. And mm -hmm. yeah, cause I'm really curious about this decision to go on that particular website and what's going on in his end. I have no idea. I just think it's an interesting question, that mm -hmm. motivation rather than taking any number of other approaches. And so I, you know, with, I, I hesitate to give specific advice cause I don't know mm -hmm. his specific situation, but kind of sounds like might be a useful time to cool his jets and, and maybe talk to somebody about trying to make sense of his relationship patterns so that he doesn't repeat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And I told him, get off that immediately. Now, what he's also finding is, is that, and I said that probably a lot of your friends are married. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed 
now in the past few months that you're not getting your the text messages have slowed down the calls have slowed down because you're no longer that married guy and i think it will threaten his friends wives and he agreed with me he did say that yeah he's mm -hmm. not getting the friendship that he was having with these guys so what do you, what do you do in a situation like that man i don't know i guess if i was him i'd, I'd ask my buddies what was going on if everything's okay mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, who, knows, just, who knows what's going on on there it could be exactly what you said it could be something else i don't know yeah so i you know i try to i try to when i talk to him i let him talk but i try to help him peel back some layers i think the best thing you can do when a guy is hurting, even though he says he's not hurting, is let him speak, yeah. you know, because I think a lot of friends will automatically give you bad advice. To me, bad advice was going on a millionaire match site. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you're, 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 all, you're just saying, I'm, you know what, here, here's another million dollars and right. let's see what we can do it again, you know? So, but I just thought that was an interesting kind of an interesting conversation we had and this was just recent that he told me but i told him to just get off that so yeah but there's this there's this phrase that i heard when i was in graduate school called flight into health and it refers to the to the idea if i'm getting it right I, there might be a slightly different definition of this but that a person will respond to being put through the ringer like that by pretending that everything is just fine and so they'll jump back in as if nothing ever happened and everything's just cool and everything's just fine. But meanwhile, they are so um, blinded and distracted by what just happened to them that they're not making decisions that are going to work out well for themselves. So I'm not saying it's happened to your, to your friend. I have no idea what's going on with him. But I do see a lot of men who come out of their divorce and they do this flight into health. They just try to jump into the next relationship and... Part of it may be trying to demonstrate to themselves that they're not broken or that the world is okay and the world's not broken and the world's not unfair. I don't know what's going on in each individual case, but it's a really dangerous uh, and vulnerable time when you're coming out of divorce and you've, you've been betrayed. I mean, that's huge. To be betrayed mm -hmm. is, is one of the most fundamental one of the most fundamental visceral experiences for a human being because we are so so social and so when somebody betrays you you really have to you owe yourself the work of figuring out how you're going to make sense of that situation before you go into the same type of relationship again mm -hmm. now do you find when somebody is betrayed they blame themselves because that's what i see a lot mm -hmm. in other words what did i do wrong it wasn't the person that cheated on me. Right. It was, did I do something wrong to make them cheat? Yeah. How do you talk to a guy like that? And that's a useful question up to a point. You have to ask You have to ask the question, how did I end up in this situation? What did I miss? Did I miss some warning signs? And sometimes the answer is no, you didn't miss anything. This is just a bad seed or a bad situation. It was beyond your control. Usually that's not the case. Usually there's some little thing, something you overlooked and it doesn't make you a bad person, but it's a really difficult thing to look at. And it's really important to know it doesn't make you a morally bad person that, that you missed something and that you may bear some responsibility for, in, for bringing this relationship into your life. Um, but it is a difficult question to sit with and mm -hmm. it's a difficult question not to go too far with. And there's, there's a, there's a sweet spot in there where you can, Look at your role in something, but not be consumed with how badly you screwed up, you know, or whatever thought thought it is that that you have, or that you're a complete idiot, or that you have no social skills, or that you, it, everything's hopeless. It's it's difficult. It's a it's a line to to walk where you're looking at the question, but not falling over the edge with it. Mm -hmm. Now, now in the manosphere, there's a phrase, and it's complacency brings breeds contempt. Do you agree with that? So help me out with that. That that refers to relationships where you, a man gets too comfortable and the woman yeah. becomes contemptuous of him. Mm -hmm. And so help me operationalize that a little bit. So what does a guy act like when he's too comfortable? He's not trying anymore. He's not taking care of himself or what? Yeah, he's he's not he's not dressing. He comes home. He mm -hmm. wears his you know his pajama pants. You know he's he's farting in front of her. He's it's just that so comfortable mm -hmm. that it just it it makes 
It just makes you repellent to a woman. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm saying this from personal because, again, when I went through a breakup here and of course, the first thing I did was blame the woman. And I, I, I had to take a step back and say, you know what? I also was responsible for this because I got complacent. I didn't do the things. I wasn't leading like I normally was in the first part of the relationship. In other words, I wasn't checking on her financial status. I wasn't doing the things that I think she expected me to do. So mm -hmm. when I say complacency breeds contempt, that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. And I, th I think it flows both ways. I think men get pretty fed up with women who let themselves go. And my wife and I made mm -hmm. an agreement when we married that we weren't going to let ourselves go physically because that's important to us. Mm -hmm. But um, it goes both ways. But there's there's a particular burden for men. There's, there's that burden of performance. And this has been um, well quantified by by various people, but there's a psycho social psychologist out of Florida where you are, um, Roy Baumeister, and okay. he has looked at societies across time and, and throughout cultures. And there is one common, well, that's very few, there's, there's a lot of commonalities, but one commonality is that the men of any society are always expected to provide something. You're expected to bring more to the tribe than you consume. You need to perform. You need to get your ass out of bed every morning, go out, conquer the day, kill something and bring it back. That's required. And it's, it seems to be an evolved trait that women appreciate that in men Men look for certain things in women. One of the things women look for in men is how well does he satisfy his burden of performance? And when you say to her, well, I give up, I'm going to, I'm just going to sit here on the couch and scratch myself and you can look at it and I'm not going to improve. Well, who, you know, what women wouldn't be turned off by that? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's kind of what I mean. I mean, there's, there's so many, so many phrases in the manosphere that, you know, resonate with me. And when you mm -hmm. break them down and actually look into them, I think it's real interesting. Now you said you mm -hmm. also do a, would you say a coaching, a coaching arm or whatever in your business yeah, I, for men? Okay. I have the clinical side of my practice where I, I can deal with Within Colorado, where I'm licensed, I can deal with clinical issues like anxiety disorders and so forth. But then there's the coaching side where I, if guys are trying to sort out questions about their relationship patterns and they're trying to, to reach a certain goal in, in relationships, then we can you know, sort of try to eliminate the obstacles between them and their goal. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you talk to a 20-year-old and a 50-year-old, does that make a difference? Say yeah, a guy's 20 yeah. years old and a guy's 50 years old. So what's yeah, the, you, what's the difference? Well, you and I are both in our fifties. And uh, mm -hmm. so we, we were talking, we were chatting a little bit earlier before we went live about how things change a little bit when you, yeah. you start calming down a little bit, you get a, less, a little less fiery about things and you start seeing things from a little, a little safer distance, I guess, or more of a distant vantage point. And so I don't know how it is for you. You can tell me how, how it is. But when I, when I look at a, a 20 year old and I listen to a 20 year old, I think of my, how I was when I was in my twenties and how naive I was about things. And mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're dummies when we're twenties. What do we know? We know nothing. We're idiots. And so, and I say that in the most affectionate way, cause mm -hmm. I was an idiot too. Yeah. And so there's, there's certain things that young guys don't know that they will learn you know, the, you can learn it the hard way by going through it, or you can learn it the easy way by seeing, by learning from other guys who've already been through it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Do you find that a 20 year old will adapt quicker than a 50 year old? In what sense? In when you're coaching them. In other words, when you're telling them like you can do this to improve your situation or can, do you see what I'm saying? Will they mm -hmm. adapt quicker? Because when you're 50, 40, 50, 60, you're set in your ways. And it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. You don't always take the advice. You might listen to it, but it doesn't mean you're going to follow yeah. through on it. So Yeah. I'll, I'll give you two answers. Um, I'll, I'll give you my personal answer and then my what I've experienced. It. My personal answer is that when I was 20 years old, I was pretty headstrong. And, and a lot of that was came out of insecurity. And so I would listen to advice from certain people, but they had to, they had to reach a certain level of, of reverence in my life. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I, I was kind of a knucklehead. And I think a lot of young guys are. 
um, that way. Now, if somebody gives me a piece of advice, I'm going to pay serious attention to it. And if it seems like good advice, I'm going to try it out. Um, so I'm, I'm much more amenable to advice than I used to be. And part of that is that I've matured and I've become more secure in who I am and so forth. But um, in terms of people who come to me, by the time somebody comes to me, they're usually looking for answers and I'm usually trying to help them find the answers. And so I, I haven't noticed any difference between young guys and older guys and, and how uh, resist, well, I don't even like that term resistant, but how open they are to, to trying things and experimenting with different things so we can try to get to an answer. And this is particularly okay. true now, of when I work with anxiety because people who come into an office to, to work with an anxiety disorder, try, try to get over an anxiety disorder, they're usually very motivated to get over that. And so there's there's very good protocols for dealing with this stuff and people are usually pretty amenable as long as I'm being respectful and not pushing them, trying, pushing them to do something that they just don't want to do or aren't ready to do or can't do yet. Are there different levels of anxiety? I mean, to me, and it, this is... This is anxiety to me. When mm -hmm. I go to bed at night, sometimes I'm thinking about my job in the morning. Like, mm -hmm. are there enough two by fours? Do <laughs> I do this? Do I, you know, did I, did I order the, the right windows? Did I, mm -hmm. that to me is anxiety. Are there different levels of anxiety? And yeah, the way all... people yeah. see anxiety. Yeah. Is yeah, it? there's all different kinds. And the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-5, um, it has some pluses and minuses. And there's some things that I don't really like about it. And there's some things that a lot of people don't really like about it. But it has a pretty nice descriptive breakdown of the different anxiety disorders. And so you're kind of a ruminator. You, your mind is always, sounds like, going off into the future and, and trying to figure out all the possibilities and permutations and things that could happen. Exactly. So you spend a lot of time in the future ruminating about that. That's a smart person problem, by the way. Um, okay. it, it takes it takes a little bit of brain power to have that that kind of anxiety. Um, doesn't mean you're dumb if you don't have that kind of anxiety, mm -hmm. but you have to be smart to have that. And then there's all different varieties of the way anxiety manifests. And anxiety always kind of boils down to the same thing. It's your mind trying to move you away from something that it thinks is dangerous, but that can manifest in all kinds of different ways. And it can get to the point where people, as you know, can just be shut into their homes because the anxiety of even setting foot outside is so overwhelming. And the answer to anxiety, whatever form it takes, is always the same. It's whatever it is that you're afraid of, if that fear is getting in the way or that anxiety is getting in the way of your of your living your life, we're going to tackle that thing. We're going to face it. If it's an elevator, we're going to ride an elevator. We're going to do it intelligently and we're going to do it in, in a very methodical way, but you're getting on that elevator if you want to get past this anxiety. It's always the same answer. Now, you're a clinical psychologist, a doctor. Do you prescribe? Because it seems like there's a, talk about a pandemic, but there's a pandemic of, of, of what are they called? Um, of antidepressants, mm -hmm. Valium, Xanax, all those anxiety medications. Yeah. Is, are, do you recommend sometimes that people get on something like that? Rarely. There are times when it makes sense. There's as bad as benzodiazepines are and they're horrible. They're a horrible drug. They're grossly over prescribed. People get addicted to them and then it can take years to get off of them. And it's just a miserable experience. But as bad as they are, sometimes there's a place for them. For example, one, one example would be you are, you get a very heightened anxiety about getting onto an airplane, but you only ride an airplane once a year. All right. So take a Xanax and ride the airplane and, and you know, how much, just, just do it. You know, so one, one Xanax a year to get you to where you're going, that's fine. Or I guess it might be two because you might have to take one coming back. Right. So, mm -hmm. so there's an example, but it, it's very sparing and we do have this, they, they should be used very sparingly. We do have this, in my estimation, uh, we grossly over prescribe SSRIs and SNRIs and, and all these antidepressants. And when I see, um, primary care physicians prescribing something like Effexor or Wellbutrin for an anxiety disorder. One of those is particularly not great for anxiety disorders. But when I see that, um, it, it's kind of disheartening to me. And, and I, don't, I don't get mad at physicians because they get like 10 minutes of training on mental health. But the, 
the best response, the, and when I say best, the response with the best outcomes for almost any kind of anxiety disorder is behavioral treatment. It's not medication. And medication can be an adjunct to that as you're building skills. But, um, you know, we, we just prescribe this stuff to a ridiculous degree. And these, these drugs are not without serious trade-offs. Okay. What's the difference between an, a, um, like a Xanax, what did you call them, and a Valium? That's Benzodiazepines. A, and an antidepressant. What's the difference between those two? The neurotransmitters that they act on. So uh, SSRIs, they, they act by blocking reuptake of serotonin in your brain or um, norepinephrine in some of them. But, and benzodiazepines, I'm, I'm a little rusty on the actual mechanics of it, so I'm going to stay away from that. But they, they block certain receptors and that lowers anxiety. But the problem with those particular drugs is that when you come off of them, you get a massive spike of anxiety. It's almost unbearable, like people crawling out of their skins because it's almost like you've pushed this spring down and by taking this drug. And when you do it for long enough, what happens is your brain adjusts and it says, okay, well, I guess we don't, this is the new normal. So we're not going to do things the way we used to do it. And then you take that drug away and suddenly this anxiety just springs to life. And it's more than anxiety. It, it's it, from what I've heard, it's just a, a physically miserable experience to, to come off of those particular drugs. Yeah. I like how you put that. So a spring under compression mm. and you're holding that spring down. And then when you get off those drugs, that spring just kind of explodes yeah. is what it seems like what you're saying. I mean, I was prescribed a antidepressant, which I never took after a car accident. Why? And I, have, I have no idea why. And this was about probably 20 years ago. I have no clue why. None. Um, well, I'm I never, glad you didn't, I, I never <laughs> glad took you didn't take it. it. Good. Yeah. I wasn't depressed. I mean, I, don't, I didn't understand why I was prescribed that. I have no clue why. So, but it seems to, yeah, it seems to be like, um, I've talked to women and a lot of women that I know and have dealt with, and I am a remodeler. So I do spend a lot of time in people's houses, but I've noticed a lot of women are on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen them, I've seen them in their cabinets and yeah. they've told me about them. So, well, women, yeah, women, I think are prescribed more often than that. I don't remember the exact, the exact numbers, but women are higher in trait neuroticism. They tend to be a little more depressed and a little more anxious on average than men. And so it would make sense that they are prescribed these medications more often than men. And more, you know, so often medication should be the last thing you try and not the first thing you try. There are times when it's the first thing you try, but they're pretty rare. Okay. Good. Well, that's some that's some good advice to anybody who might have recently been prescribed something. I mean, it you know, I think there's a way to handle things. And it sounds like you can get somebody past that so you don't have to give them something that they're going to be addicted to, which yeah, I think is important. Particularly any kind of benzodiazepine and, and the the narcotics also, the, the uh, morphines and some morphines. But those that class of drugs... Um, I think medicine has gotten pretty good at keeping people from getting addicted to the narcotics, but for some reason, the benzos are, they're just out there like leaves on the tree and, and they just get handed out like candy almost. And they're not candy. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an easy way to deal with something. It sounds like with some doctors, it's like, here, yeah. take this and you're going to be okay. You know, you won't worry. You won't do this. So I think that's, yeah. uh, yeah, that's, that's true for a while. Of, yeah, that's true for until that spring yeah. decompresses again. So, all right, well, let's switch gears here. Let's go back to the manosphere. Okay. I want to I talk about some, some manosphere labels. Like everybody seems to have a label for, for a different person. Now, you're going to be, a, you know, they're going to say, okay, well, you're not red pill. You are blue pill. Nope, mm -hmm. he's not blue pill. He's kind of red pill and blue pill, so he's purple pill. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this guy is angry, so he's black pill. Uh -huh. But this guy's a MGTOW. And now we talked about this before earlier, and I said, well, maybe I'm a MGTOW because I'm not in a relationship and don't plan on getting into one right at this point in my life. So I guess I would be considered a maybe a 
red pill or a purple pill MIG MIGTOW. So what do you think of all the labels? <laughs> and maybe maybe I'm maybe I would be called purple pill because I actually enjoy the company of women every uh -huh. now and then. I actually uh -huh. enjoy a conversation and cooking dinner and spending time. So maybe I am a purple pill MGTOW, which, but that to me, like I, I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll prescribe myself my label of the week. So what do you think of all these, these labels that are put on everybody? Well, I'm, I mentioned before that I'm not a, there are some things I don't like about the diagnostic and statistical manual. And one of the things that I don't like about it is that it gives the impression that if you slap a label on somebody, a diagnosis that you have, uh, that you understand them and mental health workers. And to some degree, depending on where they work, if they work in a real high pressure situation, they're, they're vulnerable to this and physicians should not be diagnosing people in the 15 minute visit that they get. If, if that's what they have to work with, because you slap that label on somebody, you you're not going to do any good for them really with that label, but you could have long lasting effects because they could, you know, that label is going to follow them. This whole thing about privacy in, in healthcare, it's a nonsense. Like that label is going to stick with them. So, mm -hmm. and, but the bigger issue for me is that it doesn't give you any explanation of, of the under, it doesn't give you any understanding of the problem. So if somebody comes to me and says they have panic disorder, well, I got a little sense of what that means, but I don't know what that means. We got to get into that and, and figure out when are you panicking? What's going on when you're panicking? I mean, there's so many fascinating questions to ask about a panic disorder and so many routes you can go in in trying to to fix it or or you know diminish it but the label does nothing to help you other than to say here's a little glimpse of the problem i'm dealing with so i'm not a big fan of labels i'm not a big fan of categorizing people i tend to take people as individuals and mm -hmm. there is a lot of this labeling and and there seems to be you know the the guys the, there seems to be a handful of guys that are in charge of the labels like they hand out the labels for people mm -hmm. you're this color or you're that color or you're another color and that's like the most primitive way i can think of to distinguish my team from your team but then it seems to go sometimes in some quarters to a really dark level where it becomes a, a case of good versus evil and you see this in i'm and this word cult gets used a lot in the manosphere to describe certain folks I'm, I'm not saying that but you you see that kind of thinking in things like scientology i do a lot of reading about scientology because i'm fascinated by cults and i'm fascinated this is one this is a cult that has been tremendously successful and one of the things they do is what all cults do, which is they there's us and there's them. And if you're not mm -hmm. us, then you're one of them. And if you're one of them, you're evil. So so the them in, in Scientology would be a suppressive person. That's that's their term for what would what might be considered purple pill. Um, so you're a suppressive person in Scientology, that means that not only are you a threat to the religion, but you're because you're a threat to the religion and the religion's job is to save the world you as a suppressive person are a threat to the world and what kind of person threatens the world well an evil person threatens the world threatens the safety of of innocent people so if you're a suppressive person you're evil and i i do see a bit of this going on in the manosphere where it's it's us them red blue good bad good evil and I, I don't see the value in that because I've not met anybody in all the factions of the manosphere that I would consider evil. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I really bristle at the labels taking that direction. Now, would you consider that ideology an ide ideology? I, I, I think about, I was thinking about this today, actually. Where, where's the, how do you draw, what's the line between where it, turns in turns dark like that where we're getting into good versus evil and, and i think that it really does center on ideas becoming sacred so it could be a religious idea it could be an ideology that that has become sacred and you see this a lot in my profession my profession is is just god awful about this where my the people in my profession for the most part overwhelmingly have adopted a certain ideology and it, the problem goes back a ways. There's a pro, there was a paper from 2012 that was starting to discuss psychologists mistreating each other at, on the academic side of the field because if you, you know, 99% of us are, are this ideology, and if you're the one guy over here that isn't 
of that ideology, the 99 will gang up on you. So as back as 2012, far back as 2012, this was actually being quantified and it has just gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where if you're in my field, you have to sign on to, you either have to be an outspoken person who doesn't care about the safety of their career like me, like I'm, I'm very outspoken about it, mm -hmm. or you toe the line and you just try to keep your head down so that you don't get mistreated and have your career ruined by this righteous mob that has signed on to this sacred set of ideas. And it's the same kind of process that you see in Scientology and other cults where if you don't believe these ideas, it's not that we disagree, it's that you are actually an agent of evil in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's such a dangerous way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another term, it would be they walt and a walt so yeah. all if you were to say on certain sides that not all women are like that you would be ostracized you are you're kicked out of the club mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. how do you feel about that like not all women are like that or all women are like that i i'm very i'm a data-driven person so when i hear somebody or i see somebody online saying all women are like that or some version of all women are like that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what the hell are you talking about? What do you mean exactly all women are like that? Can, can you quantify it? I've never heard anybody quantify it other than, um, you know, all women are, I, I guess it kind of boils down to all women can hurt me, um, mm -hmm. which I guess is true. Well, uh, it, it would probably lead us into hypergamy. Hypergamy is a big thing in the manosphere. Mm -hmm. And so, the hypergamous nature of women would mean all women are like that or all women are capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe that anybody is capable of anything. But mm -hmm. to me, it's kind of a dark it's kind of a dark look at women. I get it under I don't even understanding the nature of women. To me, that's another one like what does that when somebody says that to you understand the nature of women what does that mean to you yeah it's an interesting question this this whole topic that you're talking about is an interesting question because yes there is truth to it that that all women have the capacity to hurt you mm -hmm. um i like to look at cults there's, there's this guy jordan peterson he's very famous um, mm -hmm. he, he likes to look at the dark history of the 20th century and one of the points that he makes about the 20th century is that you better not assume that you couldn't have been a guard at Dachau or, or you know, one of those, you, you couldn't have become a Nazi. Don't assume that about yourself because you don't know that because almost every man, every person has the capacity in the right situation to become a monster. And if you're not willing to recognize that about yourself, you're actually a pretty dangerous person because you do have that capacity. So yes, and, and I agree with that. I think he's right about that because the people that found themselves working in prison camps, what, like there was just suddenly some, um, you know, some gathering of monsters in this one town and this one town around this prison camp suddenly just had all these monsters that were perfectly capable of just stepping into the role of prison guard. No, they're, they're regular people that got drawn into that. And he lays it out pretty nicely how that happens. And so to the manosphere's point that all women have the ability to hurt you, all women have the ability to act in uncivilized ways. Of course they do. What, what is that supposed to be some kind of insight? Of course they mm -hmm. do. So you find the ones that don't, that don't value that kind of behavior. I mean, I step back and take a look at things. To me, when I hear hypergamy, what it means to me now is, is like I said, a woman has the, has the capability of, of moving up, okay? Mm -hmm. not, not all women, I don't think, are hypergamous. I think they're capable of being hypergamous, but I also think that I would consider myself hypergamous because of course I would want the best mate for myself. But I think the definition of it is means doesn't matter who you're with, they are always, when they find someone that's better than you, you're gone. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that definition? I mean, and that's kind of what I, again, I look, I listen to different podcasts and, 
you know, because this, this is a huge word and it's become it's become very generic, too. So do you agree with with that, where you could be with your wife for 20 years and all of a sudden she's going to find that guy that's making fifty thousand dollars more than you? He's got his arms are two inches bigger than yours and she's going to go right there. To me, that's the most most popular definition of hypergamy. Yeah. Well, there's a couple so definitions. What do you, what do you that think, think of that? I mean, so let's define terms. I don't find it to be a, a very useful concept just as in the work that I do, which doesn't mean it's not useful to guys. And I, I don't, I know there are a lot of guys out there that find this, this concept of hypergamy to be extremely useful because it helps them understand how things work. And I have no problem with that because I think there's some good lessons from this manosphere definition of hypergamy. And I actually did a 42 minute video where I just droned on and on about hypergamy. And I mm -hmm. looked into it very deeply. I, like I really tried to wrap my head around this idea of hypergamy. So there's a couple of definitions. One is a, a very old, boring definition that comes out of sociology, which is that women like to date up. Okay, that's that's so obvious that it's not very interesting. And then there's the manosphere definition or the red pill, whatever you want to call it, where it has been become a crowdsourced grand unified theory of female psychology. And I, I'm overstating that. It's it's okay. I'll back off that a little bit. It's it's a very complex theory that explains most of what women do. And to my to my experience, having really looked into it, it's it's just not a very useful concept. And one of the things that it forgets, to your point, it it, it discounts some some facts about female nature, which is that females, women tend to like security. Like healthy women like secure relationships, and the, for this hypergamy framework to be a hundred percent accurate, women would have to not be security seeking creatures. That's Robert Glover's um, phrasing. He says okay. women are yep. security seeking, security seeking creatures. So, women, yes, they they are hypergamous in the sense that they they want to date up, and they are hypergamous in the sense that if you let your game fall apart, then she might find somebody more interesting. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. this, this doesn't seem like a tremendous insight to me, but. For, for as hypergamous as they might be, women don't, healthy women don't want to go to family court. It's not a picnic, even though they do better in family court. They do better with alimony. They do better with uh, custody. That's not where they want to go. They don't want to disrupt their families. They don't want to uproot their children. They don't want to um, be a disappointment to their families and, and say goodbye to their in-laws. Healthy women don't want that level of chaos in their life. And this theory of hypergamy that comes out of the red pill it suggests that women crave chaos, and I just you have to discount a lot of human nature to, for that to be true. Okay. I also think that a lot of guys use that. I don't even like saying that word, a lot of guys. Some guys will use that as a crutch. In other words, she left me because she was hypergamous. Mm. Because, I, you know, anytime I'm listening to, it doesn't matter who I listen to, or, but that word is just everywhere. It's mm. everywhere. So I also think that other people have their different version of it. Again, I have my version of it. And I did watch your video that was probably, what, six months ago mm -hmm. where you broke it all down, which I thought was really interesting. But to me, it's, it's not the end all be all. I, I, just, I just don't find it as the end all be all to a relationship gone bad. Or is it going to be in the back of my mind now in any relationship that I get into, you know, of course yeah, it's going to be there. I understand it, but I don't want to use it as a crutch, you know, and I think that's what some guys do is use it as a crutch or an excuse. Well, yeah. And you have to be, you have to be really care, careful about how you, how you think. If you want to understand human beings, you got to be careful about how you approach problems. There was this, um, do you know what a, Harispex is. Have you heard that word, Harispex? No. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a really arcane word. It was back in in Rome, in ancient ancient Rome, where these were priests that would read the entrails of animals. Okay, and so they would read the entrails of animals and they would predict the future. And supposedly, Julius Caesar, before he, all his buddies knifed him, uh, Harispex said, 
I don't even know if I'm saying that right, word right. Maybe someone correct me, but some somebody warned him about this that that had read the entrails of a sacrificial chicken or a, a sacrificial lamb, right? And so okay. that's what a Harrisbex is. So when I made that video, I get a lot of kickback from that video, and I get two kinds of responses. Nobody rebuts my arguments. No, nobody's done that. I get two responses: either somebody's telling me what color pill I am. <laughs> Pink pill yeah, or purple pill or yeah. whatever, you know, putting me on the on the purple team over there, or they give they give a, a response that's a little more thoughtful, which is, well, hypergamy fits with my experience. So okay, so what does that mean that something that an explanation fits with your experience? And I don't doubt them, by the way. I'm not I'm not saying they're wrong that this mm -hmm. fits with their experience. But going back to Julius Caesar, he could look at his hair his hair specs. If uh, I think I'm mangling that word, but he could look at his hair specs. Let's pretend that I'm saying that correctly. And he could say, if he was still alive, well, it fits with my experience that that person read the, the guts of a chicken or the liver mm -hmm. of a lamb and accurately predicted my future. So it's 100% correct that that fits with his experience. Doesn't mean that it explains his experience. So when guys come at me and they say, well, this fits with my experience, my response, first of all, is nothing. I'm not going to argue with your experience. You know, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense for you, then cool. I'm, I'm not going to try to tinker with what makes sense for you. It's not my job. And it's, it's a really arrogant thing to do. But in my mind, I'm thinking just because it fits with your experience doesn't mean it explains your experience. And this is like mm -hmm. logic 101. And men can be very logical until the emotions take over. And mm -hmm. suddenly logic gets a little fuzzy. Yeah, it, and it, as It's Matt hard to hang on to logic. As men, we're really not supposed to be emotional. I think that <laughs> I think as men, if we yeah, can you're right. if we can control our emotions, I mean, you know, we really shouldn't be angry. And that's why, like myself, also, I'm not I'm not angry at anybody in the manosphere. I don't get angry if I disagree with somebody. I I do try to look at the end goal. I look at everybody in this whole group of guys. You know, whether this team doesn't like this team or or the MGTOWs don't like the red pillars and, the, you know, the, the, the incels and the, the guys who like dating stuffed dolls, you know what I mean? But I also look at it this way. If you if you get some value out of it and you can be take a step back and look at the whole picture. And I think hopefully the end goal is to help men. And to me, that's the most important thing is helping men in this world we're yeah. in. You yeah. know, you get men get dragged through divorce court. And, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, women don't have issues also because they do. Absolutely. But I, I just don't I don't like the um, I don't like the anger, I think, is what it is. I'm not I don't you know, I've all everybody's had their anger moments, but I don't like I don't like the anger. And to me, anger is a feminine trait. The emotions, and this is me, you can tell me I'm right or wrong, but these deep emotions are more feminine. I expect a woman to react like that, not a man. You know, as a man, I think we should take a step back, look at a situation and and then deal with it. Not just there are times when you have to react, of course, whether it's a a violent situation or protecting one of your loved ones. But I don't think emotions are these 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 hardcore emotions are more feminine to me. What do you think about that? I, I think that, yeah, well, responding in an emotional way is it's not the way I want to move through the world as a man. Um, I'll just mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll put it that way because I think that's pretty accurate. But I, I think that um, you know part of that not responding in an emotional way is to try to see how things are functioning to people and try to get in other people's heads a little bit. So let's talk about the upside of this, this whole hypergamy theory that has been crowdsourced. The upside, you brought up complacency earlier, how dangerous that is. And so the lesson, I think the primary lesson of this red pill theory of hypergamy is don't be complacent. And that's a really good lesson. That's a lesson that my profession won't give to men, which is almost inhumane that, that my profession will tell men, oh, you're just fine the way you are. All you need to do is get in touch with your love language and you know, you know all this stuff that sometimes is fine. But my profession if we're going to help men understand how relationships turn out successfully, we need to start speaking about some hard truths that 
no one in my profession other than a handful of us are willing to discuss. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, when you're, when you're coaching a guy, do you use, so you don't use any of these terms, but you do use your experience in the manosphere to, to kind of, does that, in other words, does your experience in the manosphere, does it help you with your coaching? When Absolutely, because okay. there's a lot of different sources of data and the research that's out there, some of it is good data, some of it is, is crap data, like the formal research, the papers that get written. Um, and so you have to get good at, at recognizing what you can depend on and what you can't depend on in, in the professional literature. But that's just one source of data. Growing up in a bar was a source of data for me. Mm -hmm. And the manosphere, um, it, I... It, Guys have been so gracious about allowing me into this little corner of the internet, and I've learned so much from, from being there. So yeah, it's a huge source of data. So the fact that so many guys talk about hypergamy, I can I disagree with I disagree with this whole theoretical framework. I don't think it's I, well, I should say I disagree with large parts of it. I don't think it's the product of disciplined thinking. It's, it's a product of a lot of emotional thinking and some disciplined thinking. But the fact that this is speaking to so many men, well, that's important. And that needs to be attended to. Even if I don't think the theory, you know, even if it doesn't really turn my crank, I need to attend to the fact that this is working for a lot of guys. And so obviously there's something that is there and it's maybe something that I'm not under understanding yet. So, so to answer mm -hmm. your question, yes. Okay, good, good. Yeah, because it's, you know, again, we were talking about, you know, labels and all these different phrases, you know, but I think what happens is men can get caught up in phrases, terms, and not really look at themselves. Mm -hmm. Because again, to me, another emotional response that's feminine is to start blaming everybody. In other mm -hmm. words, it has nothing to do with me. I'm going to blame her or I'm going to blame my buddy because I can't handle my own responsibility. And I think as a man, we should own, own up to what we did and yeah. learn by it. But I think a lot of, a lot, or most guys don't, I don't even want to say most, some guys don't own up to the problem that they caused or the issue that they had. So. Yeah. And I would say more often than not, it's just that you don't know any better when you're making choices. And, and this is why young guys in particular young guys in their teens and, and early 20s shouldn't be making big decisions about relationships because there's just mm -hmm. way too much on the line to and you that's the that's the time in life where you're pressured to make big decisions and you know the least and that's kind of a setup so i'm i'm mm -hmm. always telling guys to pump the brake on pump the brakes okay. on the big decisions okay can 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 let's say somebody's not in colorado can they still consult with you like mm -hmm. through a skype interview yeah, it depends on on the issue. Yeah, if it's not a if it's not something that shows up in the DSM or the ICD like an anxiety disorder, and it's more of we're trying to get to a goal, more coaching, then yeah, I can I can do some of that. Okay, and so how can guys? How can everybody find you? Whether it be your social media or, you know, what's the best way to find you everywhere? Well, I have a website docsmith.co, and then I'm on Twitter at Iron Shrink, and that's my only social media. So. You can find me okay. there. Okay, awesome. Well, it was really good talking with you, and I hope we can do this again because I think I could talk to you for hours. There's so many topics that, you know, and again, you being part of the Manosphere, I don't know if you were drawn into the Manosphere, kind of like the Mafia, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think you're a very big part of it. I mean, I've seen two of your speeches, which I thought were incredible one of your one of the first books that i read was yours and i'll tell everybody any man should get this book especially if you're looking at or if you're in a relationship or getting into a relationship or just just get this book and read it i think it's absolutely one of my in fact this book is probably the third copy and the last time i i lent it out i actually got it back with a nice note so well, um, thanks, Tony. That, that's really generous yep, of you. Yep. So uh, I do appreciate your time, and let's do this again sometime. Yeah, it's really good to see you, Tony. Thank you. Good to see you, too. Thank All you. All right. Talk again. Take care. Bye.